The question I get asked most at the end of my career is, why did you become a military? Why did you choose that profession? And at the end of my tour, I also got the question, why climate? Why as a military are you concerned with climate change? And to answer that question, I have to go back to my youth and I had to reflect on, okay, what, what drove me to do this kind of work? And I guess I was intrigued by my father's stories. My father grew up in the Second World War. His whole youth was war. He didn't have a youth. And he grew up in Rotterdam. And we all know what happened in Rotterdam. The whole place was bombarded and they suffered from the hunger winters. So I was intrigued by those stories. And in, in my youth, I read a lot of books about the uh, uh, people who were, went into the opposition and who uh, tried to fight the enemies from inside. Very simple people, ordinary people who were uh, behind the scenes working on uh, resisting uh, the occupants of other countries here in the Netherlands. And I was really intrigued by those people. I was intrigued by how ordinary people can do extraordinary things. And I think that kind of triggered something in me that I wanted to become a military. And over time in my career, when I saw more and more conflict areas in the country, I started to realize how special this country is. And what a special position we have in the world, how rich we are. And once we are here, we are kind of spoiled. We have 70 years of peace. And we are kind of used to that, and we complain when we don't get enough uh, sunlight or whatever. Uh, <laughs> we always have something to complain, but we don't always realize how good we have it. And I dedicated my life to make sure that we can keep it that way. And that my children can grow up in that same safe world that we can grow up in. And that's what drove me. And that's also what drove me towards climate change. That's because in climate change, I see the same kind of thing happening. Climate change is something that threatens our existence, that threatens the planet of which we only have one, on which we live. And if you don't do something about it, and I'm a military, I'm a pragmatic guy, if you don't do something about it, our next generation, my children, will have to pay for it. And I don't want to have that on my conscience. So. To myself, I said, okay, if your military career stops, then that's something that you, can, that you can keep on contributing. And that's what I do. I use my experience, I use my influence to, uh, to help others to counter climate change. Now, what, what do I want to talk to you about tonight? Let's first say what I do not want to talk about. I don't want to talk about why climate change is so important. I think we have that, heard that story hundreds of times, and we all know it. I also don't want to talk about the nexus between climate change and security. I think we also all know that. And we all know that extreme weather events, yeah, you need the assistance of the military to cope with it. There is a, a military dimension to it. Uh, when the, the hurricane struck St. Martin, who comes to help? You need the military to do that, so the military need to be prepared to do that. We also know that climate change drives food shortages, water shortages, etc. And especially in fragile countries, those kind of changes fuel the tensions that are already there. So they can lead to conflicts. So also there, there is a relationship with security. And then there is a geopolitical aspect of it. And maybe Mr. Amin will tell more about it because we have worked together on that. <laughs> and he's a leading figure on the renewables. But the impact of uh, the melting cap in the Arctic and the opening up of a whole new arena in the north and the impact of renewables, the whole transition towards new renewables, uh, the impact of that on OPEC countries, on gas and oil producing countries, well, uh, it does make you think about how that affects uh, the balance of power in the world. So also that has a security dimension to it. Uh, so from all those uh, as aspects, I think also the military should take climate change more seriously and should take a look at what role they can play in countering climate change itself, or dealing with the effects of climate change. So that's what drove me. But I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> what I'm going to talk about is the two things. The first one is what hampers us from doing something about it. Because for some reason, it's very difficult to get it into motion. We, we all talk the talk. 
but we don't walk the talk. It's very hard to go walking. Uh, we all repeat the same words, how important it is, and we should take action, and we, we use the word action a lot, but we don't do it. Why not? What stops us from doing that? And I think there are a few things. First of all, I think we come from uh, different worlds. If you look at uh, security and climate, uh, climate was a bit of a left-wing hobby, tree-hugger thing, and security was a bit of the right-wing hardliners. And they didn't talk with each other in the past. But over time, these worlds start growing together. And over time, we started to appreciate each other more. And we started to recognize that the one cannot do without the other. And I've experienced that. In, when I was a commander in Afghanistan, we had a huge fight over a village where the Taliban had a lot of food on the ground. We have fought for days there. And we, at the end, we, we beat the Taliban, we got them out of the village, uh, but we didn't solve the problem. And they could get in any moment, back in. Uh, it took us uh, some months to find out what the real problem was. And the real problem was a conflict over water. Who gets what part of the water? It's an agricultural country, all farmers, and they all want water, and there is not enough of it, so they were fighting over that, and the Taliban used that friction to get settled in that village. And once we realized that that was the underlying root of the conflict, we were able to send in a few diplomats, water managers, we are good at that in the Netherlands, and they negotiated a solution within the village. And from that moment on, the tensions were gone. And the Taliban could not get any food on the ground anymore. And for me, this is a good example of how development and military can work together and depend upon each other and need to work together. So I'm a believer. I'm a believer in this comprehensive approach. I'm a believer in a whole of government approach. I'm a believer that there is no conflict that the military can solve. But the military is always part of the solution. But there are, you have other players as well that you need to have a full solution. Uh, we can fix a problem in a country, but if there is no prospect for the local population, then the problem will return as soon as you leave. Uh, so development and security need to go hand in hand. And the same is with climate change. So that, that's one thing that stops us from working together. We come from very different world, worlds, so for politicians, especially for more right-wing politicians, it's, it's easier or not so easy to accept that climate change is also something on their agenda. <laughs> and uh, luckily, nowadays, we more and more realize that both security and climate change are of existential importance for all of us. So it should be on all of our agendas. Whatever political background you have, whatever religious background you have, whatever ethnical background you have. And I'm glad to see that more and more this is being accepted. Now the second thing that stops us from taking action is that climate change is too big, too complex. We don't know the consequences exactly, we don't know the costs uh, exactly, we don't know what measures to take, so everybody thinks, hey, well, well, can I bring that change? No, let the government deal with it. So most people stay, stay aside and don't take a role because they don't know what to do and they don't see that they can make a difference. And what I have learned in the past is that every individual can have an important difference, can make an important difference. And especially if millions of individuals make a small difference, then together we make a very big difference. So it's about getting it in motion. And the formula I would like to introduce here, and that would be the, the last part of my story, to get it into motion, the formula I would like to give to you is think big, act small, start somewhere. And this is a formula that works. And I introduced that formula two years ago when we had the Future Force Conference. And in that Future Force Conference, it was about security, we invited 1,300 stakeholders to the Netherlands from 60 different countries. Stakeholders, not military. There were maybe 100 military in the room and 1,200 non-military. All academics, researchers, cyber uh, experts, uh, social inventors, all, all kinds of, uh, all walks of life were there. And we gave them a chance to talk about security issues, 
uh, that were of interest to them as well. So mega cities, uh, climate and security, uh, cyber threats, all these kinds of security related issues that everybody has some uh, interest in. And the interesting thing is that all these different stakeholders had very different agendas, very different backgrounds. They were not used to work together because, yeah, a hacker and the military, how do you combine that? Uh, but on those topics, they found out they have a common interest. And this common ground you can use to create synergy. And it worked. So in this conference, you saw on each of these topics, you saw a kind of a chemistry with networks being connected, all kinds of ideas started growing up, and all kinds of initiatives started to, uh, to be launched. And in this conference, I use this conference, still on the thinking big side, uh, to, uh, to offer defense as a platform for innovation. And now I come to the act small and start somewhere. In this conference, there were several inventors. And one of them was a man, and some of you might have heard of him, uh, Abve Hegge. Uh, he is a man he, with a wild idea. And his thinking big was, I can help solve the world's problem with drinking water. And his invention was a device that could extract water from dry air in the desert, powered by a solar panel. And when he told me that, uh, I thought, well, sounds good, but I re didn't really believe him. <laughs> so I almost walked away. But then I realized, hey, you offer defense as a platform, you initiated this, so you also have to walk your talk. So I went back to him and I offered him the opportunity to test his device in Mali, in our base, in the desert. And he did. So two weeks later, he was in his plane with his whole gear and his, uh, his team, and he tested the device for several weeks in the desert. And it worked. He was able to extract water from desert air. Small amounts. And the technology he used was, has been used elsewhere as well. But he further developed that idea. And, and I'm very proud that today I could uh, announce that he has a breakthrough. He has a breakthrough with a very new technological way of condensing water in the air that allows him to produce with a small machine. Can we show it? Ah, this is the condensation uh, machine. A small machine the size of a, a table uh, uh, refrigerator <laughs> with a solar panel on top, he can produce 20 liters of water per day. And the only ingredients he uses, the only ingredients he uses is solar and air. For the rest, it's self-sustaining. Now imagine the impact that such an invention can have on people living in desert areas, on people living in Northern Africa, people living in the Middle East, uh, but also on mega cities, making mega cities more self-sustaining. Imagine if you could do this larger scale. You don't have to desalinate water. You don't have to pull it out of the ground with the ground levels of water dropping and dropping and rivers drying out. You can generate your water on a new way. And uh, this is an example for me. Because I think there are many of these inventors out there. There are many of these great thinkers out there that deserve an opportunity. And I would like to offer them all opportunities. And if only one of 10 ideas works, I'm very happy. Because that one idea can make a big difference. And he's now working on a second development. And that's this one. He uses a similar technology to condense, condensate water out of air. Uh, but he creates kind of a closed environment, a container. And in that container, he puts uh, s uh, LED lights. And that LED lights simulate the sunlight. So they give the same kind of lights as the sun gives that a plant needs to grow. And he uses this technology to recycle the water in the air. And he uses the knowledge that a, any plant all the water it uses, 90% of that water will evaporate again. And he recycles that water over and over again. So it's a closed circuit. You can put the box in the desert, wait for a few months, and you can uh, harvest the crops. A container, 
just with a few solar panels. It doesn't need any support. Imagine what an invention like that could mean for people with where there is food shortage. Now, aren't that amazing inventions? And that gives me energy. And I'm very glad that I'm in a position that I can help people like him. And for me, he's an example. He's an example of many of these, I call them unsung heroes, that are out there screaming for an opportunity, but they don't get the opportunity because we don't give them. So my call upon you was to reach out to each other, and if you have somebody with an idea, give him the chance or her to operate that idea. Give him a chance or her to, to work on it and to allow that idea to be tested. And again, only one out of 10 or one out of 100 needs to, to succeed, but then you can make a difference. Thank you.